Welcome, welcome. I see some folks are joining us right now. We're going to give everybody a couple of minutes to get settled and get cozy. We've got about two more minutes before we begin. So feel free to grab a drink, grab your snack, whatever you need to make yourself comfortable. I'm pretty excited this evening because I've got my nice warm coffee with me, although it's not that cold of a December day here in Indiana. Little different, but I'm not going to complain. All right, well, hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for History Happy Hour, Indiana Store, the History of LS Ayers. My name is Beth Brandon and I am the Manager of Education here at the Indiana Historical Society. And it is so great to see so many of you on and rolling in. Don't worry if you're just joining, you haven't missed anything. We'll get y'all caught up. Um, at the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. So we collect paper-based documents such as books and paintings and photographs and letters, diaries, maps, and so much more, all to tell Indiana's unique stories. We then find ways to share these stories through publications, through exhibits, and events just like this to hopefully inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Tonight, we get the awesome opportunity. I'm so excited, you guys. We get the opportunity to be chatting with Dan Shockley, the Creative Director of Exhibits and Audience Experience, and Ken Turchi, the author of LS Ayers and Company, The Store at the Crossroads of America, among many other things and talents. <laughs> um, so we get to chat with these two folks as we reminisce and learn about one of Indiana's iconic department stores that if you're like me, you hold near and dear to your heart in family history and memories and everything, especially with the holiday seasons. So thank you both for joining us. We are so glad to have you. But before I hand it over to Dan, a couple of things I wanna go over, just logistics, make sure we're all on the same page. So for our event tonight, um, Dan and Ken are going to be talking for about like 35, 40 minutes. Um, and during that conversation, if you have questions and things that pop up, we would love to hear from you because you'll get the chance to have those questions answered. So in the Q&A section, you can, or the chat, you can pop those in and we will be monitoring those to make sure that we can answer as many as possible at the end of our program today. So we will be keeping an eye out for that. Um, and if there are any issues with that, again, there should be a couple of different options for either the chat or the Q&A. Um, if you would like to add anything, make sure that you, when you get to it, there should be a selection to either click hosts and panelists or everyone. Um, so whichever way you would like to share that with us. Also throughout the night, our team will be dropping in links into the chat. So tons of stuff, tons of resources. In fact, some even some holiday shopping goodies if you're still looking for a few, we'll have that for you. Now, of course, if we're sharing a bunch of stuff, sometimes I get really overwhelmed when I'm on a Zoom and there's so many links to look at, but there's so much going on during the program too. 
So don't fret. We will email you all of these things in a follow-up email within the next week. This program is being recorded. Take note. So we hope to be able to replay this for you coming up. You can always check out all of our video resources that we have, and I will pop that link in as well um, for you into the chat as we get going so that you can check out all of the previous history happy hours and things that we've done. Of course, we have several events coming up and we'd love to talk to you more about those too. So you can always visit our calendar, indianahistory.org backslash visit backslash calendar. Don't worry, we'll give it all to you. Our next big event is Good Cheers and Ugly Sweaters, which is in person at the Eugenia Maryland Glick Indiana History Center. But that's not what we're here for tonight. We're here to talk about Ellis Ayers. So without further ado, I'd love to pass it on over to Mr. Dan Shockley. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I see several names in the chat there that I recognize. So welcome. Um, and welcome to those of you that I'm meeting for the first time. Being that it is happy hour, my drink of choice is Diet Coke. And uh, Ken, what are you drinking this happy hour? I'm drinking water. This is not vodka or gin, I promise. It's a glass of water. It's nice I to be here. I believe you. Well, thank you. Um, so I had the pleasure of working with Ken in, in 2014, 2015, um, and other times. But really, we worked uh, closely together in putting together that Ayers Look, an exhibit we had here at the Historical Society. I hope many of you got a chance to see that. Um, and it was really his book uh, really kind of informed the exhibit and, and all of the research that he had done in going into the book. Uh, and it was a history and a celebration of the Ellis Air store and the people who, who made it what it was. Um, when I think of Ellis Airs, you know, I grew up here in Indianapolis. So for me, Ellis Airs was the downtown store. And um, I know Ken, though, has um, experience with uh, a different store, another Airs uh, location, and has information on all of them and uh, Airway and, and various other offshoots of the company, too. So, uh, Ken, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Nice, nice to be with all of you tonight. So um, I want to just jump right in. You know, the, the subtitle of your book is The Store at the Crossroads of America. Um, it, it, will you kind of talk a little bit about that and why you were interested in writing the book and, and some history? All right. Well, uh, Ayers literally was at the crossroads of America, at least um, from 1905 until it, until it closed in 1992. Uh, Meridian Street and Washington Street, US 40, the National Road, was thought by many to be the crossroads of America. Uh, like a lot of department stores, it started out as a, as a dry goods store uh, and was one of the first stores in the country to establish a one price, no haggling philosophy. Uh, you didn't go in and bargain for goods or ask them to throw in other goods if you bought something like the old general stores used to do. Um, under the leadership of Lyman Ayers, the store uh, quickly established itself as a, as a high quality store in Indianapolis. And um, it, it grew very quickly from uh, headquarters on in the first block of West Washington Street and uh, by 1905, under the leadership of Lyman Ayers' son, Frederick Ayers, had moved to the corner of uh, Meridian, Washington at the Crossroads of America, and it uh, stayed there for the next um, 87 years. I have uh, really strong memories of Ayers uh, as a kid coming downtown with my mother and my grandmother on the bus. My mother didn't drive then, um, neither did my grandmother actually, and so we would take the bus downtown. And that's not something we did every day. So it was, it was a big deal. You know, we would dress up for that. We would uh, shop in the store, have lunch in the tea room. I would dig something out of the uh, toy chest, the uh, chest. And um, it was always an event when I was a child to come downtown and to shop at Ayers. Um, and you have a, a history with Ayers as well, a little different history, is that correct? Right. I grew up in Crawfordsville, and um, we often came to Indianapolis or, or went to Lafayette, which was closer than Indianapolis, to shop at Ayers. 
I ended up working um, all the way through college at the Ayers store in Lafayette, which was actually Ayers' first branch store. It opened in the summer of 1958. And that's what first got me interested in the store and, and in retailing along with some other places I worked in high school. Um, but from the first day I worked there, it was made very clear to me that this was, um, uh, it was a big deal to work at Ayers. It was, you know, the, the expectations were high. You had to work hard. You had to wait on customers. We had good merchandise. It was a, it was a, a professional environment as retailing went. And um, that made a real impression on me at the age of 18. And so really, stayed. go ahead. Really, your history with the store is lifelong, isn't it? Right, it is. It is. And um, many years later, I uh, approached John Herbst, the former C CEO of the Historical Society, about writing a book about heirs. And um, he uh, graciously said, sure, we, ha we have something about heirs in the queue anyway, so you might as well write it. And uh, so I did. It took a long time, but um, having the archives at the Historical Society was a big help. And I interviewed about 40 people, many of whom have passed away. So I was fortunate to have the opportunity to meet with them when I did. And um, uh, turned out, I think, a pretty, a pretty interesting story about the company. So, you know, you just mentioned the people you spoke with and really kind of one of the things I learned and, and really learned from you through the whole process is Ayers was, yes, a department store, but really was about the people. It was, it was. It was about the people and it was about the Ayers family having the foresight to hire really smart, forward thinking, innovative people to work there. Several members of the Ayers family worked there, but, but they expanded. They were not, not afraid to bring in outsiders. In 1922, for instance, um, uh, Fred Ayers and uh, a cousin of his, uh, Ted Griffith, hired a man named James Gloin um, out of Harvard Business School, Harvard MBA School, uh, when MBAs were really a rare commodity. And um, Jim Gloin had a disability that um, uh, prevented him from going to, the, to World War II and also scared off Eli Lilly and company. They didn't want to hire him. He had scoliosis and he was a, uh, deformed. But um, it was Ayers' gain and our city's gain because Mr. Goyen went on to serve Ayers for the next 40 some years, eventually became president of the store. And he, he and Ted Griffith saw the store through the, through the Depression and through the Second World War. And he and others um, took the store into a number of different directions. And Ayers really became a full fledged merchandising company, not just a department store. And that enabled him to stay independent. Um, long after another, a lot of other family department stores had sold out to big chains. Ayers was independent for a full 100 years. And you could probably count on one hand the number of other department stores that were still independent by then. And it was their diversification and business vision that enabled them to stay independent. That's great. Um, so that's some of the, the folks on the business side. Mm -hmm. um, what about a couple of people maybe on the, uh, the fashion or the retail side the, the, who kind of, you know, selected what people were wearing in Indianapolis at the time? Ayers, uh, Indianapolis had three department stores um, for most of the 20th century. If you don't count Lazarus, which was an, an interloper from Columbus. Uh, <laughs> Ayers always had the reputation of being the, the highest quality store and the most fashion oriented store. Um, one of the brilliant, one of the brilliant ideas of Ted Griffith was um, to realize at the end of the First World War that well dressed women with money were not going to have clothes custom made for them anymore. Uh, before the first, before the 1920s, you went to Ayers and bought high quality fabrics and buttons and trimmings and so forth. And then you took them to the sixth floor and had them made for you. Ayers had uh, more than 40 dressmakers on the sixth floor who made dresses for you. And um, Ted Griffith realized with the advent of ready-made fashions and the Seventh Avenue that still exists to some degree today, that um, clothes ready, ready to wear was the, was the future. And he needed to bring his customers along to realize that you could get high quality, high fashion ready to wear too. It wasn't all going to be just, just stamped out of the assembly line. So he came up with that 
with the concept of that heir's look, meaning that um, well-dressed women could buy ready-made clothes and still be well-dressed, whatever price you paid. And it was that, that fashion slogan that helped heirs differentiate itself throughout the years as being the fashion leader, realizing that not everyone could afford to pay $250 for a dress during the depression, but it was that stamp of quality that, that permeated the store on every floor, every price point, every piece of merchandise had a certain aura of quality. The slide you see now is um, an heirs look um, advertisement from 1937. And that was the first year that heirs advertised in national magazines like Bazaar and Vanity Fair and Vogue. Um, and it, it continued until, until the 1980s. Um, as, as, the, as the trend-setting store of the three. Blocks, um, William H. Block Company was probably always stronger in men's clothing. And Wasson's across the street was a, a notch or two below, a little more of an every man store, but it also had some nice lines too. And the three stores competed effectively, but Ayers, Ayers was always the market leader. They all had their niche, but Ayers That's was right. on top. Right. So um, when you talk about uh, heirs, a lot of times people will think, and even though heirs is no longer there, the heirs building is still there, right? as is the heirs clock. Mm -hmm. We kind of talk about the, the iconic nature of the clock. The clock was the, uh, the brainchild of uh, Roland Allen, who was the store's longtime personnel director. He was there from the 1930s until the 1960s. Did a lot for race relations at Ayers and for race relations in the community. He was a very active civil rights advocate. He and another, uh, some of the other managers at Ayers um, decided the store needed to have a clock um, as, as an icon, as, um, as a part of the store's brand although I don't think brand really wasn't as much of a concept then as it is now. But the two of them hatched the scheme and they wanted it to be, they used the example of Marshall Fields in Chicago uh, as, a, as a store that was identified by its clock. Uh, and the two of them kind of hook, uh, cooked up this scheme to convince um, Mr. Ayers, Frederick Ayers, to sign off on this when he came back from his summer vacation. The rumor was also that Blocks was thinking about putting up a clock too, and I think they wanted to be ahead of Blocks. <laughs> so the clock went up in 1937, and it became uh, part of the store's advertising and um, part of the store's identification. It's still there today. Um, the Historic Landmarks Foundation, Indiana Landmarks is called now, played a role in raising money a few years ago to have it, um, have it restored. And I think it's still running. I don't. I don't live in Indianapolis anymore, so I haven't. I haven't been downtown in a while, but I know it's still there, mm -hmm. and it's it's still an icon of our downtown. It is. I know that uh, people would meet under the clock. Meet me under the clock. If somebody said that for downtown Indianapolis, you knew where to go. You were. That's going right. To the, the corner of Washington and Meridian at the Ayers Building. That's right. Um, and uh, in in preparation for any exhibit I do I always talk to my family you know I talk to a lot of people but I'll say hey what are your memories and my sister would talk about the um the uh book that was on the first floor where if you went into the store you could tell your friend hey I'm gonna be up in the sheet music department mm -hmm. um uh, meet me there type of thing um so it really can you talk a little bit about the store maybe as a gathering place maybe how the the Tea room might have fit into that, or sure, sure. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was remember uh, we didn't go to downtown Indianapolis a lot when I was growing up. We went more often to Glendale, uh, but um, I remember that book inside the front door. It was on a stand. It was on a, a, a wooden shelf between the revolving doors, and you would say, you know, I'm right. I'm on the fifth floor. I'm at the bus station. It was. It was, uh, you know, we didn't have text messaging then, but it fulfilled exactly that function of letting people know where you were. Mm -hmm. So the store was a gathering place. Um, I have a friend who tells a story about on um, the north side of Indianapolis after the war, 
uh, a lot of the well, well-to-do families had maids, live-in maids, and the maid's day off was, was Thursday. And um, you would you'd go down, drive down Central Avenue or Penn, or, and the maids would be out waiting for the bus. And they all got on the bus and went, I spent the day at Ayers. <laughs> Can you imagine what they talked about? <laughs> Who they talked about? Oh, I'm uh, sure that's what they were doing. Yeah, so um, it was a gathering place. And Ayers deliberately put a lot of activities into the store to get you to stay longer. Um, everyone remembers the tea room. The tea room was on the eighth floor. It was on the fifth floor originally, but then when the store expanded in the 20s, it moved to the eighth floor. That was a deliberate decision because it was on the top floor of the store and you had to get to the top floor to eat and then go down floor by floor to see everything on your way down. Um, it was also was um, the first floor in the, in the store to be air conditioned. Um, and that was delivered also. And they would advertise it, you know, that the store had a restaurant and then also an auditorium next door. And they advertised in the paper, bring your, um, uh, if you're a club that has a civic event, mm. reserve the tea room. If, bring your bridge club to the tea room to play bridge. Smart. So, you know, bring them in and then they'll stay. The food at the tea, the tea room was never a moneymaker. Uh, food is sold at best at cost. Uh, but it was a way to bring people into the store. Uh, and um, definitely something that everyone rec everyone that I talked to remembers about the store. Well, when I talked to my mother about the store, um, one of the things she said is how clean the restrooms always were. Yes. And that may seem like a very little thing, but any of us that have been into a public restroom, which is probably all of us, she said that wasn't a little thing she said that was massive you know you you come downtown you bring your kids and you know having just that just that attention to the store yes. um it was welcoming yes the store was always kept clean and the merchandise was usually picked up put away um you know if you go into a store now it's just it's it looks like it's been ransacked mm -hmm. and uh but we had you know um, we were talking before we started tonight about the perpetual state of everything being on sale all the time. But back into back before the 1970s, stores only had sales once or twice a year other than month end clearances. And customers were, were accustomed to paying full price for most merchandise. And stores could afford to have more salespeople. Um, and those, when those salespeople were not waiting on customers, they were straightening the merchandise. They were putting out new merchandise, rearranging the merchandise. They were not allowed to stand around and talk to each other. That was, um, I got um, called on the carpet for that a couple of times, but only a couple, only once by our very uh, real taskmaster uh, store manager, whom I respected a lot. Um, that's just how it was, you know, you, you, went, you expected to be taken care of when you went into airs and the clean restrooms and the overall cleanliness of the store were um, very much a part of the experience. Well, you had mentioned when we first started how air started as a dry goods store. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned a couple minutes ago about the sheet music department. Mm -hmm. um, what other kinds of departments did airs have uh, that, you know, we wouldn't really think of today as being in a, a department store? Right, right. You know, department stores now are almost all focused on apparel and accessories and some home goods. Uh, I was struck by the last the last time I was in Macy's in Indianapolis at Castleton. Uh, most of the second floor that that had um, china, silverware, glassware, things like that has been taken over by something called Backstage, which is I guess it's like TJ Maxx or something. But department stores were known for having deep selections of, um, of table linens, um, ta tablecloths, napkins, china, crystal, silver. Um, you know, people don't live that way anymore. And I can understand why stores don't carry that. But Ayers was very well known for its bridal goods selection. Um, and it's where people went, where many brides went to register for their weddings. They went to Ayers to register. Um, Ayers also had a very strong children's department um, back 
started back when um, stores didn't have a strong selection of children's clothes. Uh, Ayers brought in um, a woman from Carson Perry Scott in Chicago to start a children's department, actually, mm-hmm. back in 1910, 1912. Um, many people have told me that they remember going to Ayers twice a year to get their school clothes, you know, and to get their wardrobe for the coming year. Ayers had a lot of other lesser known, to, well, not lesser known, but let me put it this way. Most people under 40 don't realize that department stores used to be just that. They had a complete array of really everything you needed for your home except groceries. Ayers had wallpaper. Uh, they had paint. Hmm. They had um, um, metal sheds that you put in the backyard. They had lawnmowers. And gradually these items were phased out. Sure. But um, they, they had, you mentioned sheet music. They had a wonderful sheet music department. They had player piano roles. We had a player piano when I was a kid, and that was a, a treat to go to Ayers. Um, underneath where um, Palomino used to be, downtown Indianapolis at Maryland and uh, Maryland and Illinois streets, was a vast sort of sagging basement that had all of those departments in it. Um, mm-hmm. They had washing machines, dryers, and refrigerators, all of that stuff. Um, they did have sheet music. They had what many thought was the finest bookstore in the state. They had a wonderful book buyer who helped people shape, who helped shape the tastes of, of people in Indiana. Um, you could, or you ordered stationery there. You ordered your wedding stationery, printed stationery. They could, they could replate silver. You get your baby shoes bronzed there. They also had outside services like draperies, carpet um, installation, carpet cleaning. A lot of these departments were leased but they helped the store get what we now call a customer share of wallet. You know, as many products and services from that store as possible. They had a drug store. Um, they had, you know, their own brand of toilet paper and sanitary napkins and uh, health and beauty aids, um, really everything. And remember that until the early 60s, you could call and order it all by phone and it would be delivered for free. And a Robin's Egg Blue Step Man. I mean, it was a, you know, um, really complete and marvelous selection. Uh, so it really could take you from birth to death? Yeah, just about. Yeah, yeah. And they had also a complete, a complete budget floor in the basement, mm-hmm. the downstairs store. And um, uh, one of the former... Uh, executives told me that the they had a special line of clothes designed for the budget store that was of co- comparable quality to what you get at Macy's now. So it wasn't just the clearance; it was an no, it was a se- yeah, it was a separate line of budget budget store items. We were talking the other day that people, I'm struck now by the, l- the lack of quality in clothes now, but people don't wear them as long. They're disposable in a way. They're disposable. Yeah, yeah. I have some, there's some brands of shoes like Allen Edmonds makes very good shoes. I've had some Allen Edmonds shoes for 20 years, but most clothing now is designed to be worn for a year or two and then then thrown out. And that's not the way it was when department stores were at their peak. Sure. Um, we just got a question come in. I'm, I'm going to drop it in now and then we'll okay. go back. Um, so outside of downtown Indianapolis, uh, where might other locations, where would we find other locations for Ayers and maybe some of the, the subsidiary stores? Yeah. I'll start with the subsidiary because this is one thing that where Ayers was really different from other department stores. They realized in the early 60s that I mentioned this earlier, to stay competitive, they had to be in the merchandising business, not the department store business. And they picked up on an idea that was germinating with other department stores to go into high, high quality discount retailing. And that's where the airway stores came from. Um, there were other discount stores, but they were pretty shoddy and the merchandise was un- uneven quality. Airway's slogan was department store um, quality at discount store prices. And um, Airway opened in the fall of 1961. There were eventually probably about 30 or 40 Airway stores. Um, they got the idea or they shared ideas with the Dayton family, which owned um, Dayton's in Minneapolis, which was very similar to Ayers. Um, one thing that I was surprised in my research was that Ayer, when Ayers opened, they, they 
preceded by a few weeks or months. They, they were the first, um, the first discount store of its kind, their kind of opened. So they, they beat Kmart and Walmart and Target uh, to the finish line to be the first stores to open. But they were, Airway was very comparable to Target as people who are from around here know. So that was a big, a big thing. They also went in the specialty shop um, line with a, two stores called Sycamore Shops and Signet Shops. Sycamore Shops is more like uh, the limited and um, Signet Shops were more like a junior line of clothes. And they had other subsidiaries too. But as far as full line department stores went, um, at its peak, Ayers had 25 stores um, all over Indiana, as far north as Merrillville and as, um, as far south as Bloomington. And then in the mid, Ayers was acquired by Associated Dry Goods in 1972. And then in the early 80s, to, to head off, to fend off competition that was going on in other markets, um, Ayers acquired Pogues in Cincinnati, which was a similar store to Ayers, part of Associated Dry Goods, and Stewart's in Louisville, which was another similar store to Ayers, part of the same corporate family. So that's how they ended up with 25 stores. The core Ayers store business um, would have been probably about 18, 17, 18 stores that were originally Ayers stores. They did. They also acquired uh, Wolf and Dessauer in Fort Wayne, which was a the LS Airs of Fort Wayne and another small chain in Louisville, which was not, which is kind of a third or fourth rate group of stores there. But 25 was the maximum number. Did each of those stores have their own version of the tea room, or was the tea room really iconic to the downtown indie store? Uh, Lafayette had a small cafeteria. Um, I think the, the Fort Wayne, Ayers opened a store in Fort Wayne in the mid-60s. I think it had a restaurant. The, the Wolf and Dessauer store that they acquired in downtown Fort Wayne had a restaurant. Um, I don't think any of the other stores did. Tea rooms are more part of, um, at least for Ayers, they were part of the downtown experience. They took up a lot of space in the store. And when you're going for sales per square foot, that's not what you want. And they didn't make money. So um, the heirs, heirs did not pursue those as vigorously as some other stores did. People loved it, but it wasn't maybe yeah. their favorite department in the suburbs. Right. And in the suburbs, the, the, the notion of shopping in the suburbs was come as you are, bring the kids, get in and out. You didn't, you didn't go to a suburban store for a day of shopping. It was more to run errands. Yeah. Um, so Ayers was around for around 100 years. So mm -hmm. it saw several different wars throughout its time. Um, what was wartime like uh, for the Ayers store? Uh, they had to adapt. Um, in the First World War, Ayers continued to pay all of its employees who were in the war. Uh, the, um, and a lot of the, the employees spent a lot of time wrapping ba rolling bandages for the war effort. Wow. when they were waiting on customers. The 40s um, brought a lot of shortages. Um, there were, merchandise just wasn't available for sale. Um, heirs of, uh, Lyman heirs and Fred heirs, the two brothers who were the grandsons of the first Lyman heirs, were off in the war, as were a lot of the other store executives, except, as I mentioned, James Gloin, who wasn't able to go. So they, they were just trying to keep the store together. One interesting thing I thought that they did, looking into the future, knowing the war would end at some time. In 1942, they brought in uh, the Skidmore um, architectural firm to do a complete review of the store to decide how the store should be configured in a post-war environment so that when the war did end, they would be ready to go. Um, the, the store was kept open at night during the Second World War to accommodate war workers. A lot of women went to work. Um, and then they had huge war bond rallies um, where they would, you know, stop, you know, stop the clock and sell bonds and sell millions of dollars worth of bonds. And the, the employee who sold, sold the most bonds was invited to have lunch at the executive's table in the tea room. Wow. Yeah. That is quite a list. I mean, that yeah. was... Yeah. Um, so uh, something that um, 
we talked about a long time ago that I thought was super interesting was kind of the buyers for the different departments. Like each, each correct me if I'm wrong, each department had its own buyer specific to it. And um, like there was a, a, a <clears throat> an area for college age students and there was a college board. Did right, the college, the college board didn't have buying responsibilities, right. but they were, um, they were a public relations effort for the store. <laughs> all, all three of Indianapolis department stores had them and every department store probably had college board. There, um, they Can you tell us what a college board is. Uh, sure, young women, in some cases, young men, um, uh, who interview, who applied, and were accepted to become part of this, this board of young people, who uh, on Saturdays and on their vacations spent time in the store, wearing fashions from the store, modeling, and sometimes working on the sales floor. Although that was, you know, not always available, um, they were ambassadors for the store. Each, each college and university around the area had a college board representative supposed to encourage their friends to um, come to heirs to shop. It's pretty smart. Yeah. That was a smart move. Right. Um, so uh, so let's talk about some other employees. Uh, let's talk about race and employees, how that kind of um, evolved over time with the heirs store. I found several examples of, of uh, how really how well um, employees were treated within the context of the times. I mentioned Roland Allen earlier, um, uh, back in the 30s and 40s, as, it, as was the custom then, uh, black employees tended to be either uh, warehouse employees, janitors, um, uh, porters, you know, to work in the store during the day, um, doormen uh, to open the door for, for people as they got out of their limousine or elevator operators. Uh, most of the elevator operators were black. Roland Allen was uh, appalled at the condition of the lounge areas and restrooms for black people and improved the conditions for them. Uh, Ayers very quietly integrated the tea room in 1950. Uh, there was never any explicit segregation of it that I was able to find, but there are, there are letters in the file, in Fred Ayers' files, of um, Ted Griffith's files, excuse me, of um, a black bridge club that wanted to reserve the tea room to play bridge, as I mentioned earlier, that's what people did. And so um, uh, Mr. Ayers' assistant took this note in and said, this group wants to come and I just should let you know that they live on such and such a street, like over around Indiana Avenue. And so it was evident sure. that they were black. And he said, well, no. so <laughs> that's fine. And so they, this group of women showed up to play bridge and nothing happened and nothing was said. Uh, the most amazing story to me was that in the, in the 1960s, early 60s, two more stories, yes, the early 60s, the store's elevators in the South building were automated. They, they didn't need elevator operators anymore. And so the store took a, made a real effort to find positions for which those elevator operators were suited. Some of them um, took jobs and took back room jobs, marking merchandise and so forth. But another one of them um, decided she wanted to try sales. And uh, so they made that available and she became, uh, worked in the silver department, which was a uh, rather pres prestigious um, uh, occupation and became one of the best salespeople of silver in the in the store. Um, Dan Evans, a uh, name you may know, you may know the, may know his son's name, who was involved in uh, many things and just retired as CEO of um, uh, IU Health. Mm -hmm. Dan Evans' his father was president of the store, spent his whole career there, was president of the store in the 60s and 70s. He made a real effort to improve race relations in the community and to hire more black people. Uh, also, he was he who um, appointed the store's first woman vice president, Beverly Rice. But he uh, lectured before a lot of church groups, civic groups, chamber of commerce. So we have to do better at hiring black people in Indianapolis. And in particular, um, I have a lot of respect for him for this, made inroads into Louisville when the store acquired the Kaufman Strauss chain in Louisville in 1969, really push the envelope there for hiring more Blacks. And Louisville was much more backward, probably 100 years behind Indianapolis in the 60s. 
Wow. Yeah, he, he made real uh, made a real effort there too. That's great. Thank you. Um, we just had a question come in, uh, and I know that we've talked about this before, but the question is about uh, employees' lunchroom. We know the tea room. Uh, what what was available for employees? The uh, the downtown store anyway had an employee cafeteria on the seventh floor. Um, I've seen pictures of it. I don't think I was ever there. I've seen pictures of it. Um, it was for employees. It was a very important to Roland Allen in particular that store that people had it would have a place to eat lunch. It was expensive to eat lunch downtown. Food at the the lunch counters and the dime stores and so forth was not inexpensive, um, cheaper than the tea room, but not and not very good quality. So it was this very similar food that was available in the tea room and it was served at cost to employees. Mm. And it was there um, pretty much until the downtown store closed, at least until the late 80s. So um, what were some of the first of LS Airs? Uh, you know, you talked about they were first with Airway. Mm -hmm. They beat everybody else to Airway uh, by a hot minute, right? Things were yeah, by a few weeks. weeks. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, what other kinds of things do you think of as like first with the company or with people with the company? I, I have a list in my book if anyone wants to purchase it and follow along. But um, just a few of the things here is um, uh, they gave employees a Saturday half day off, which was unusual. This was back in the early part of the 20th century. First in Indianapolis with a store magazine. Uh, they were the first store to have company paid group life insurance and hospital insurance. Uh, first ones with Airway. Uh, they were the first to offer credit privileges to um, minors, to anyone under 21. They had a special mm -hmm. sort of a high school charge account. Um, uh, they um, also were the first store to um, institute a five-day business week. Uh, they were having trouble attracting um, executive um, uh, recruits, management training recruits, because the store was open on Saturdays. So um, John Peacock told me this story. He flew, um, he was part of, again, part of the Ayers family. He was the executive of the store for many, many years. He was dispatched to Hartford, Connecticut, which then I guess now too was a headquarters for many life insurance companies uh, to meet with the CEO of G Fox and company, which was the LS Ayers of Hartford. And she explained that the reason, the, the way she was having trouble uh, attracting management trainees because the insurance companies were getting them all. And if you went to the insurance company to work, you work Monday through Friday. Mm. So she came up with this idea that they would be closed on Monday and everyone would work Tuesday through Saturday and get a weekend, your weekend being Sunday and Monday. So in 1948, Ayers put that policy in place. Some of the other downtown stores followed, uh, blocks did not. Um, and it enabled them to bring on, you know, They've been able to attract people that were may have been going to other headquarters in Indianapolis. Indianapolis had many more corporate headquarters then than they do now. And it stayed in place until the early 60s when um, Glendale opened and it was difficult to juggle that schedule. Um, but it was it was a five day store and they promoted it very heavily. So street cars, they had a sign on the side of the building that said closed Mondays. I mean, it was it was a five day store uh. closed. Close Mondays. Well, I don't know if this was a first, but you know, when we had the Ayers exhibit here, we had it here about a year and a half, and and we heard story after story after story from people. We had several former employees come in, but countless, countless shoppers, mm -hmm. and several people talked about the escalators mm -hmm. and like it being their first escalator that they ever saw that they ever rode on. Mm -hmm. um, and and you were talking about how. You know, the tea room is on the eighth floor, so you had to come down, you could take mm -hmm. the elevator, and at a certain point, you took the escalator, and you could see a lot of the store that way, and think, right. got to go to that department. Right. You say anything about the es uh, escalators? Interestingly, Wasson's, uh, either Wasson's or Blocks was the first store with escalators, 
but Ayers did a better job of promoting it, and people remember that remember the escalators at Ayers. I think also because more people shopped at Ayers. Sure. Uh, also, interestingly, Ayers did not have escalators above the fourth floor until the early '60s, late '50s, early '60s. So they were fairly late to the game with having the whole having escalators go to all the stores, all the floors. Nor was the store air conditioned above the fourth floor until the night, late 1950s, except for the eighth floor tea room. Wow. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what this is? Yes. What is this? <laughs> that is called a, um, I don't remember what it's called, but when you purchase something for cash, it went into, um, oh, it's a tube, I guess. It's a, it's a cash tube. You put the cash in the receipt in there and it went into a tube and went to the basement to the tube room where the change was made and it was put back in the tube and sent back to the sales desk. As far as I know, those tubes are still there. Really? In the basement underneath the building. Um, it just, there would be no way to get them out. Uh, I think there's the park, a parking garage under there now, but somewhere down there, and I can't imagine they would ever been able to get all those tubes out. When was the last time you were in the building? It's been since Carson Perry Scott closed okay. and they, have, they had the walls up. Mm -hmm. So whenever that was. Yeah, that's, that's a shame that that is, I believe, mostly empty. I do think there are some uh, offices and things on some of the higher floors. Right, right. It's a, it was, last time I was in the mall, I passed through into the mall from Washington Street. Right, right. And there's not much left of the mall either. Um, yeah. It was... It was a foregone conclusion when Nordstrom left that that would be the end of Circle Center. That's so, a shame. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to switch over to something happier. All right. And um, somebody has sent a question that gives me the perfect opportunity. I don't recall this, but they're asking about a big red flat Christmas candle that was put on the side of the building. Do you know what that is? I do. Uh, it went up. I don't. I couldn't tell you offhand exactly when it went up, but it went up in probably after the war, late '40s, in the middle of the building on the uh, on the Washington Street side. There's a door. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, it so went up really. several floors. Yeah. And then in the early '60s, I believe it was um, taken down and replaced with the giant wreath that we saw that's on the left. The the wreath on the yeah. The, there's you can see the can't the. Uh, Image on the left is from 1958. You can see a little bit of the candle there. And I don't know when the image on the right is from. I don't, maybe from the 1970s. Uh, I don't think so, though, because the, at one point, a giant wreath was put up hmm. where that candle is. And I think that went up in the early 60s. Yeah. Wonder what ever happened to that? I don't know. Probably just fell apart. Um, so, as we're seeing the pictures, can you talk a little bit about Ayers uh, at Christmas? Sure. Um, Ayers worked on their Christmas windows all year and Christmas decorations all year. They had a full-time staff. Um, Indianapolis, Ayers was unique in that most cities the size of Indianapolis did not have department stores that designed their own windows. They, there's the wreath, that, yeah, uh, the ladder that replaced the candle. Most department stores in cities the size of the size of Indianapolis bought displays from department stores in larger cities, like from Philadelphia or Chicago. Uh, Ayers designed them all here in Indianapolis and um, had a theme every year, put them up, and they were never repeated. After Christmas was over, they were sold to a department store in a smaller city. Sure. And that was the last anyone saw them. But uh, the Christmas windows were... Um, uh, People remember them so well. And, and one thing that we may not remember is some of them were animated. The, the big window at the corner was always anima animated. And the other department stores had them too. But they were also, there was also merchandise in the windows. Um, and there's a picture in my book. I, I did not know this until I worked on the book. Uh, every year on Christmas Eve, all the merchandise came out and they just put like, you know, Merry Christmas signs in the windows. Wow. That is one of my childhood memories, certainly, is going downtown and either driving or walking around to see the windows. See the windows, yeah. Look yeah. at the crowds on the street in that picture. Yeah. And look how they're dressed. Yeah. Look yeah. how they're, they're dressed. dressed. Yeah. Any gloves? I guess it's cold out. It's so there cold, would be gloves yeah. anyway. But, yeah. Um, you know, that is something about 
shopping, you know, certainly in my youth and before people dressed up, it was a, uh, you didn't wear your sweatpants no. uh, to no. go downtown to Ayers. Right. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how people would, you know, kind of what the store meant to people in that way? Well, going downtown was, well, people just dressed better in general then. And going downtown meant that you would dress respect, respectably. Um, remember also, too, that you, you didn't lug your packages home with you usually. You mm -hmm. usually had them sent. Um, so you didn't, even if you took the bus, you weren't getting on and off the bus with a lot of packages. Um, and, you know, downtown, even into the 60s, was, was kind of a special occasion. You were, for a lot of women, it was a day out. Uh, my mother and her best friend would come over from Crawfordsville and, and um, spend the you know, morning and the afternoon. And we were not a family of great means, but my mother would just enjoy looking. Mm -hmm. um, she used to talk about the fifth floor that had the china and crystal. They always, they always had tables set, round tables set in the aisle on the fifth floor where you could just look at table settings. And then if something interested you, someone would be there to answer a question. And if not, they didn't, they didn't bother you. Um, that was a lot of the experience. It was just a day, a day out to, you know, look around at things and to have lunch in the tea room, which, by the way, from 1942 until the 70s had a men's line and a men's eating area because the men who went to the tea room were working and they didn't have time to, you know, goof around. So they were seated separately if they wanted to go into the men's area and the women who were there had had more time would wait in the longer line. So window shopping, your mother would window shop. Right. And sometimes, yeah, certainly we did that as well. And um, I want to remind everybody, if you have questions, please drop them uh, in and Beth and Marissa will, will get them to us. Uh, we do have a question that just came in. Do you remember a small area for children to buy gifts for family? I there's remember. A picture of, there's a picture of that in my book, uh, Christmas Christmas Village LSA, I think it was called. And it was a little area that had gifts that would be appropriate for children to buy for their parents. And they advertised it in the paper. They would list the gifts. One thing that's kind of funny today is that they always advertise ashtrays. Buy your, <laughs> buy your dad an ashtray for 50 cents. <laughs> Instead of a tie this year, get him, right, an, get ashtray. him an ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, so another thing that's come in is uh, riding the Christmas train. Remember riding the Christmas train and sitting on Santa's lap. Sure. Um, I think we have a picture of that too. Yes, that, that, that particular train was in, don't remember exactly when, but it was in place in the 50s and 60s. And I have a very, I'm, I'm 64. So I have, a, I have a very vague memory of riding that train once. Um, that very, that, that little train. Yeah. Um, went in around the eighth, the eighth floor auditorium into Santa's village. Mm. Yeah. But that was definitely my, my era where kids took the train back to see Santa. Yeah. I, um, I do believe I remember riding the train. Sometimes it's hard to remember what's your memory and what you've been told. Right. What you've been told. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I do believe I'm a few years younger, but barely. And so I, I believe I remember writing that as well. Maybe we wrote it together, Ken. Probably so. <laughs> I thought that was you back there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The little eight-year-old with the beard. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was me. That was me. So yeah, if you have more questions, do please keep them coming. Um. I've got a lot of questions here. I'm trying to narrow down for you because I think we're, yeah, we're getting close on time. Yeah. Um, did heirs have a house credit card? Just yes. Can't. Yes. Um, originally the, um, the credit card looked like a dog tag. I'll show you something here. Okay. It looked like a dog tag. And um, the other department, the other Indianapolis department stores participated. It was called Charger Plate Associates. But then I think it was probably after Ayers was sold or maybe not, they um, came out with their own card. And I don't know if you can, how well you can see this, but this card right here, the, the white and turquoise one, yeah, that's, that was good at both LS Ayers and Airway stores. Huh. And it ended in number one, 
meaning that um, that was a that card revolved. We didn't have to pay it off in 30 days. Okay. But then if you had a card like this one, this white one here. Yeah. Uh, this one, it was white with the blue LS errors come. It ended in a two. That was a generally thought of as a more prestigious customer because that ended in a two. I mean, you had to pay it off in 30 days. Okay. So you were not a, it was a charge card, not a credit card. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Um, uh, so we've had three questions come get, come in. I'm going to ask you this one and we're going to end on a higher note. <laughs> All right. Good. But what are some of the reasons that led to the closing of the downtown store and airs kind of in, in general? Oh, a lot of, a lot of reasons. Um, Indianapolis downtown began to deteriorate. The, be the beginning of the end of Ayers downtown was when Glendale opened. Um, they, the Ayers family put a lot of effort into making Glendale a full line, beautiful, wonderful store. It was easy to get to. Um, you didn't feel like you had to dress up to go there and they had every, every level of service, all the merchandise. Downtown started to fall apart in the 60s. Um, Ayers, to their credit, continued to invest in the store long after downtown was viable. I'm sure the store lost money for many years. Shopping habits changed. Women went back to work. They didn't have time to spend uh, lunchtime in an afternoon wandering around in a department store. Um, we, we earlier were talking about this. Um, people began to get accustomed to not having to pay full price for anything. And that the model changed when, when uh, People didn't want to pay full price. There's Glendale um, before it was enclosed. So a lot of things conspired against the department stores. And then um, Airway and the discount merchandisers came in and made things, get things cheaper there. Uh, the, um, the category killers started to open, you know, like um, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Hi-Fi Buys, all those places with much deeper selection. And then, um, and Borders Bookstore, you know, you name it, all those things we were mentioning earlier, just the stores open that carried 25, 30,000 square feet of one item. Right. You could get it airs. Uh, so a lot of things, a lot of factors conspired against it. Um, uh, and, and people just live differently now. Mm. And not to mention the internet, of course, but all this was on the way out, way on the way out before Amazon came in. Right, right. Um, a question here about uh, Hoosier Bargain Days. Uh huh. Was Ayers part of Hoosier Bargain Days? How were yes. they involved? And uh, was the March of Dimes involved in? I think I think they were. Hoosier Bargain Day was um, the downtown merchants put it on. I don't know when it started. I think if memory serves, it was January, February. It was a chance for the the downtown merchants to clear out all their merchandise that hadn't sold. Um, uh, at, low, at low prices, um, but again, you know, it was one day out of the year. There, there was a difference between a clearance and a sale. You know, we were talking earlier that um, gold toe socks would have a once a year manufacturer authorized sale of socks. They were on sale all the time, mm -hmm. um, and that was that was the norm. And then every every month we had an end of month clearance at airs, uh, and things were marked as if the price, if this price ended in 97, 1297, that meant it was never going to be marked up again. It was I was trying to get it out the door. That's what Hoosier Bargain Day was like. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are nearing the end. Uh, if Beth, you can let me know if that is correct. But I have a question come in that I want to ask. And kind of in general, you know, we've talked about Christmas at, during at Ayers. Um, other holidays, uh, maybe some memories of other holidays, and in particular, somebody's asking about Mr. Bunny's Barnyard. Because I was just going to bring that up. That Easter was a close second in um, in volume for for heirs and for most department stores. Combination of buying school clothes and and Easter holiday. And Easter was a big deal, particularly for children's and women's clothes. And yes, Mr. Bar Bunny's Barnyard was at Ayers. Uh, they for had a real alive animals. You know, a, a friend of mine worked in visuals at Ayers in the early 80s, and they brought baby chicks, little chickens in to Mr. Barn and Bunny's barnyard. 
and they didn't know what to do with them at the end. So he took them home. And, you know, before he knew it, he had chickens running around, live chickens running around in his backyard. This is before it became fashionable to raise right, yeah. chickens. He had a little porch swing in the backyard and they'd be up there on, on the swing. <laughs> <laughs> they brought a donkey up there i have a picture somewhere i don't think i put it in the book of a donkey in front of a in front of the uh, a gold mirror by the tea room because they had to bring it up in the freight, freight elevator and lead it through to the auditorium Aww. and they had a live easter bunny and do you know who the original easter bunny was uh, are you going to say hal fryer i was yes yeah Harlow Hickenlooper yep. was the original Mr. Bunny. I ran into him there one day when I was doing my research and he told me he was the original Mr. But Mr. Bunny. And he yes. sent me some articles. He said, I was a terrible Mr. Bunny. He said, I didn't realize that to deal with kids, you have to get down in front of them. So I, I'd be way up here. And he was tall yeah. with these ears. Oh, kids! <laughs> They'd turn around and run away, screaming and crying. <laughs> so it took me a while to realize, you know, how to relate to small children. <laughs> we were so lucky to have him be one of our actors here late in his career. Oh, yes, um, that's what he was doing there one day. I think, yeah, yeah, he was such a nice man. Yeah, he acted in several of our spaces, our exhibits. Yeah. Well, we're about done here. We didn't even mention the cherub, but you can see there in the chat, we've dropped a, a link in there to buy a cherub Christmas ornament. Um, so uh, he is uh, still flying around, I'm sure. And hopefully we'll see him. He should be there now, I guess. Right. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to turn it back over to Beth. But first, Ken, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. Well, thank you for, for having me. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks Merry for Christmas. letting me share some memories here. And, and thank you for all the great questions. Thank you so much. I learned so much today of, from a topic that I like to just reminisce and talk with my family about. And now so many things so multifaceted that I did not know. If you were interested in that cherub that we were just talking about, that hangs out on the clock. If you make it to downtown Indianapolis, have a little look to see if you can see. Um, I love the story of the cherub. So yeah, we put a little link in there so that you can learn a little bit more. Along with learning more, you can also do that by getting into Ken's book, which seriously, Trevor, treasure trove of information. Uh, I mean, like- It's great. Like really. It's a terrific book. Like we touched, the surface barely tonight. So make sure you check that out. Of course, if you enjoyed your time with us tonight, we'd love to have you back for other programs that we have going on. Um, we'll share our the book, what that looks like real fast. I'm a visual learner myself, but we'd love to have you back for other programs. So you can check that out on our calendar. Our next program, which is in your chat, is Good Cheers and Ugly Sweaters. But of course, before even that comes up right now, you can visit Festival of Trees. So at the history at the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana History Center, we have 75 decorated trees around the building. This one happens to be the LS Ayers tree. So you can get check out that Ayers look is really the title of the tree, that Ayers look, and um, see a couple of unique items around that tree. So we'd love to have you back for that as well. We will be posting this conversation to our IHS YouTube channel and our website in the coming weeks. But in the meantime, if you would like to revisit anything from the past year or past several years, for that matter, you are welcome to visit us online for our virtual resources and a plethora of videos to enjoy. And if you missed your chance to donate and you'd like to further um, give a gift to support the Indiana Historical Society, you can do that via a link we will be dropping into the chat. Your donation helps us to continue to share Hoosier stories, to continue programming and education. Uh, so we really, truly thank you for helping us to fulfill our mission of being Indiana storytellers and sharing these stories really worldwide. Um, so thank you so much. Also, logistical note, in the next week or so, probably in the next couple of days, you will be getting an email that has a whole bunch of li uh, links to collections, images, 
um, to items if you are not quite done with your holiday shopping to check out, um, as well as a link for a survey. We'd love to get your feedback. What do you like? What would you like to see next from us? Of course, that was just one of Ken's books, but there are several to check out. So, are there three? Three. There are three. That's okay. several, yeah. That is several, yes. Um, and I highly, highly recommend them. Uh, Marissa is going to be dropping those. Oh, she already did drop those in the chat. Um, looking forward, giving back Jewish merchants of downtown Indianapolis is one of my most favorite reads of recent. Um, you seriously, you thought we were just diving deep, like a little, little deep dive on uh, Ellis Ayers. Just you wait, just you wait. So make sure you check those out. Um, and thank you so much. We will see you guys hopefully very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night.